afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've already been introduced, and I'm going to take us through uh, this sample transport innovation and the kind of impact it has had uh, to the diagnostic services in Uganda. So our, I don't have, oh, it is here, sorry. Okay. Uh, as a way of background, we all understand the central role of diagnostics in patient care. And uh, in resource-limited settings, it's not possible to have the necessary infrastructure and manpower and all other amenities needed for quality lab services everywhere. So uh, the few service centers that could have that kind of uh, infrastructure may not be accessible to most of the countryside. Uh, that's the need to create access. And this sample transport innovation is one approach to ensure that access can be made uh, 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 possible for high-tech diagnostics. And uh, for us to think, through, uh, uh, to think about this uh, is when we, we, we are grappling with how to increase access to EID services. We had one lab that we had set up for molecular diagnostics for babies, but accessing that lab by the entire country was a nightmare. And thinking through uh, what we had at the moment and what we needed to have that access, that's how the system came up. And working with the health development partners, we sat and we agreed to come up with a national system to do this. Though it started as a system for EID, it has eventually evolved as a national system to support uh, diagnostics across the board. Uh, this system, uh, the biggest challenge uh, with the networks in the countryside, how do you get the lower sites link up to create a network that can connect them? To the, central, to the central level. So we thought about setting up small networks at centers that we called hubs. And these networks were supported by a mechanism that allows them to link with the, with, with the facilities within their catchment. And uh, would select an, a, a facility within a, a sub-region and that one would be the hub and create a network that connects with it. And with that system, we are able to have something like this, which we did not have at all before. Eh? So from the lower sites to the hub, and then using the courier, Posta Uganda would link up to the central level where the labs are. Just uh, for more information on what a hub is and how it is formulated, a hub is a health facility within the region which has got some infra laboratory infrastructure. But this lab infrastructure is improved to be able to do more than what yeah, it, it was meant for to support diagnostic services in that facility. This time it's going to support a wider, uh, a wider range uh, or a wider scope uh, by supporting the lower sites. So would improve their infrastructure, uh, their equipment profile, manpower, and then set up a quality system. Then map using GIS, map a, a catchment around it within a range of about 30 to 40 kilometer radius, and then locate the facilities within that catchment. Then create a schedule uh, which allows uh, data, which allows uh, 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 a connectivity whereby this, these facilities can actually be linked to a central point, which is the hub. And then we would provide a rider, a bike and a rider, and uh, with the facilitation to keep doing routing, routing through this network, uh, bringing samples to the hub. And then uh, the hub would select what they are able to do to run there, and what they are not able to run is what they refer now through the courier to the central lab. This is how the system was uh, was crafted, that was the thinking. And um, it worked out actually, we started by a few hubs which were 19, 
and uh, running them for over a year, we learned lessons. And uh, through these lessons, uh, our development partners bought in. They, f they saw it as a very novel and cost-effective way to actually improve access to services across the board. So this, this has been eventually scaled up. What was 19 is now 100 hubs. When you see the color codes here, the color codes indicate which partner. We have basically three CD4 I mean PEPFA agencies that support uh, implementing partners. That's CDC, uh, DOD, and USID. So you'll find the way they share, uh, they share the hubs across the country. So the partners working within these regions are supported by virtue of how many hubs they are actually supporting. That's the that's how their resources are rationalized. So uh, the 100 hubs have been set up across the country, and uh, amazingly, they are reaching close to 3,000 facilities. With your 100 hubs, you can connect. You're connected to close to 3,000 facilities, and that's almost about 90% of all health facility cover in the country. So. Uh, so that we decided when we scaled up to, that this cannot be run centrally. The few hubs we started with, we, run, we, we managed them centrally, but it couldn't be after we scale up. So we decided that the regional uh, uh, implementing partners will take on the support of the hubs. And our development partners agreed to this and gave them money to do so. So uh, because of... Uh, of, of its potential to revolutionize services, it was actually selected as, as a best practice, which Pangea and Chai actually uh, did evaluate uh, uh, earlier, uh, late last year and early this year. So with the improved infrastructure, equipment, personnel, hubs are able uh, to offer services that are not available to most of the, the lower uh, sites like CD4, CBC, chemistry, gene expert, sickle cell, hepatitis, just name the list keeps growing because already the infrastructure is there, it is just easy to actually keep uploading things on it. So um, this is how the system works from facilities to the hub, that is the rider, then from the hub to the, to the central lab, that's the courier. Then we are also working on a mechanism to move results, where results don't have to go, you know, uh, the hard way, the way the samples come. So we are uh, starting a, 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 an electronic transfer of results so that we reduce on the turnaround time. So in terms of impact, how much impact has this had? When you look at this particular hub, when you look at this particular, this is one hub. Before this system was up, it was only providing services to its own patients in the hospital where it is located. But after we actually set up this, uh, many other services started rolling for the lower sites. And over time, uh, uh, this particular site has offered so much for the lower, the lower facilities. Whatever you see here comes from the lower facilities, not from what uh, that hospital uh, patients, uh, patient services uh, uh, that they traditionally used to offer. So the rider uh, picks these samples and then drops them at the facility and drops uh, results whenever they are moving back. So just a case, just to show how powerful this can be, this one center is supporting like 30 facilities. And these 30 facilities have been able to actually access these services that they were not able to have before. And this is how it works. In terms of turnaround time, when we set it up, we, we actually, for our EID services, turnaround time was over a month, close to to two months, but it actually went down to two weeks, sorry. It actually went down, it went down to two weeks because of the ease of moving samples, 
but also the efficiency that we created by having one central lab. Before we had eight labs, but we had a lab turnaround time of 25 days because of the so many dynamics of, of sample volumes, batching, and the, 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 the issues around optimizing lab services. But when we reduced, we put it in one lab, actually the lab turnaround time reduced to two days from 25 days. And with the sample transport system, things actually improved further in terms of turnaround time. So let us look at how this uh, system has been able to actually uh, increase uh, uh, um, uh, access nationally. That was the one, the, the, the previous slide was showing access at this one particular hub, supporting the 30 facilities, but now this is at the, the national level. So high caliber lab services, um, which cannot be attained at the lower levels, are at national reference labs. For instance, services for viral load, for, for hepatitis, um, uh, services for viral load, for EID, for some of hemorrhagic fevers and, uh, and, and outbreak potential uh, diseases cannot be all over the countryside. So they are located in reference labs within, within Kampala largely. But uh, these ones have been accessed through the sample transport system. So uh, using the courier, from the hub using the courier, uh, the samples move to the, to, to, to the center and the system supports a wide range of these samples. So when you look at this table here, uh, this is just uh, uh, last year actually from, uh, sorry, from uh, October last year to September this year, this is what moved through EID over 100,000 viral load close to 600,000 samples, sickle cell this much, pathology, uh, it was a nightmare before actually moving pathology samples. Uh, pathologists had trouble. They, 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 they do a surgery, take off a biopsy, but the biopsy can keep three, four, five months before they even know how it can go to one lab within, within, within uh, our national teaching hospital for actual diagnosis, but they are now able to move samples routinely. Uh, these these uh, surveillance samples, outbreak samples, we are able to actually manage outbreaks efficiently because of the sample transport system. So down the road, you see how much has been supported through this system. This system is not only supporting the movement of samples, but we are also managing the logistics, logistics that go with collection of these samples. Also, these logistics move through this system, and we are, we are efficiently managing that no site needs, for instance, sample collection materials, and they don't have them. Just because we have connectivity, we are connected to the sites on an ongoing basis, even the logistics are easily moved through this system. So 100% of EID sickle cell uh, uh, materials are moved through this system to over 2,500 facilities. Distribution of uh, viral load sample collection materials also the same way and uh, quality control panels for, for quality control especially for HIV rapid testing and a couple of other quality control programs use the same system to move their materials. So through this evaluation that was done, it was costed, and the costing actually showed that uh, it costs about uh, uh, $1.5 dollar. They only costed for EID and viral load. And at a time where the samples were still few, we, were, we had not scaled up widely. But uh, 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 they also, uh, uh, they also, uh, extrapolated it if we scaled up, for instance, viral load, and it comes to less than a dollar, even after putting in all the other amenities to make the services more robust, it comes to less than a dollar. So it is not very expensive, but it's very robust that it can be able to support so much. So this costing was only for EID and viral load. 
just imagine all the other services that are moved, all the other samples that are moved. Those are not costed. But if all that is costed, it becomes much, much cheaper. So the challenges, uh, suboptimal financial uh, support mechanisms, especially by implementing partners. Some of them, uh, they have a very bureaucratic system of accessing. If a bike is down, it needs some procurement process to fix, which can take longer than necessary. Lack of tracking, we need a tracking mechanism where we can track the samples moving through this system. Uh, the courier is not, sustain, uh, is not suitable. The courier we are using is not suitable for medical transport. Uh, poor prioritization by IP, some of them don't take it as a cardinal service. They don't pay enough, enough attention to make sure things are running. A lack of close monitoring, the partners need to be monitored to make sure things are happening as expected. And then uh, we are doing one visit at the moment because we have one bike per hub uh, per week, which is not as optimal. So we did, one, we did a pilot in one region, piloting if we had a regional person based within the region. Uh, how can it change the services in this region? And we picked one of the poorest, the poorly performing regions by, uh, through a pilot that we are running with support from Kulta, Beckman Kulta. We want to thank Tony and the team. I wonder whether Tony is around, just for recognition. Thank you. And then the person who is in the region, uh, that's the person supported by Kulta, Beckman Kulta, to actually stay in that region and see whether things can can change. It's not long since we did this. This is the region. Uh, uh, it's it's West Nile region, and the person is best here, but supporting all these hubs within that that region. And these terms of reference are to have regular coordination meetings with all stakeholders in the region, support supervision and mentorships of the lower sites and the hub, link the, uh, link the gap between the ministry and implementing partners in the region, uh, advocate for increased utilization of services, support uh, ongoing operations for the, the sample transport network, and generate regular reports for, 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 for national stakeholders. So what has happened in the before, when you look at this chart here, the blue chart, the blue bar shows what happened before. In the region, these are the samples in the three months that we are collected, but through his work, actually the samples skyrocketed over three times in barely three months. That shows you if we have a person supporting the hubs, how powerful it can be. And uh, uh, at the hub, the samples generated within the hub uh, increased by almost three times. Then the samples coming from lower sites to the hubs also increased by about six times. It was almost not happening, but it happened by his presence there. And then samples coming from the hub to the central level also increased by close to seven times in just barely three months by having a person sitting in there. This is another snapshot of gene expert. This site has got gene expert. Before this person was there, uh, the site was able to do just these uh, 224 gene expert tests in three months. But in three months of being there, the volume went up. And uh, before he went there, all the gene expert tests they were doing were from their patients in that site. The lower sites were not benefiting. But when he went there, the lower sites actually started doing testing, accessing the gene expert capacity in this facility. So that is to show uh, if more support is given. Finally, this is the last slide. Conclusions and next steps. Next steps. The hub system has uh, transformed the paradigm of lab services across uh, 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 by reorganizing lab services to a fewer service points. The system has provided unprecedented access to critical diagnostics. The system has reduced the costs of sample transports and will co the costs will just continue to go down as the services scale up. An additional uh, next steps, 
we need to have like an additional motorbike. So you have two motorbikes per, per hub. Then if we can have a, a coordinator sitting in the region, like what we have piloted in one health region, we have 14 health regions. If we can have a coordinator in each of the health regions, the services will actually skyrocket. Uh, introduce a tracking system where we can be able to track every sample as they are loaded uh, for transport and then improve the courier service by engaging a more medically oriented uh, courier mechanism. At the moment we are using courier, Uga, uh, Posta Uganda, which generally is used to transport parcels and they also transport people in their vans, but we are using the same system. Uh, so uh, if we can have uh, a, a, a way to actually have uh, medically oriented vans for this transport, we are already spending a lot of money. To, uh, we are spending about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per month to pay Posta Uganda. That same money can run this system if we can get the initial investment of getting the vans. The thirty and as the services even scale by uh, by by Feb or March this next year, we are supposed to be giving them about forty to forty-five thousand dollars per month for their work but to a service which is not as robust but we can actually use the same money but offer more efficient services thank you very much thank you very much charles um, we'll have a chance to come back to questions in just a couple of minutes uh, but if i could ask our second speaker who is uh, Dr. Peter Ehrenkrantz, the Senior Program Manager of the Gates Foundation. Uh, Gates has been absolutely fundamental in uh, supporting, one might even say provoking, innovation in both um, uh, technologies and service deliveries. Um, has been a huge supporter of trying to look at different ways of uh, improving uh, the delivery of diagnostics. And uh, Peter, it would be great if you could just set out um, the foundation's strategies and your thoughts on where this may go. While I'm doing that, can you? Um, I think we're just setting up. Oh, is it, is it, oh, okay, fine. Hello. I'm going to give a very, uh, hopefully, just a five-minute presentation, uh, just to follow on Charles's uh, very impressive description of the of the specimen hub transportation system in Uganda. And my task is to talk about can we figure out a way to take these lessons learned and, and disseminate them and help implement them um, beyond what we're just the discussion. I think oftentimes we come to conferences, we learn all sorts of great ideas. And then sometimes we go home with the intention of trying to figure out how to do it. And immediately we are stuck with our volume of emails and other uh, tasks that we hit. So here we go. I don't have to tell anybody in this room about the, about the bottom line on this slide. but. Sample transportation, it turns out, is just one of, of the many critical aspects that make up a national laboratory system. And my little diagram here, I, I purposely put that et cetera on the bottom because I, the list, anybody who makes this list might do it in a different way. Um, uh, but certainly supply chain and data systems and, and the, the machines themselves, all these things are, are essential. And as is the sample transportation system that Charles just described. So. Just a little note before I talk about how it might be taken up, I want us to think a little bit about what it means for uh, an innovative intervention like this to be uh, adopted. Please excuse my misspelling in the, in the word elsewhere. Because um, it turns out that long-term integration is complex, and Charles just noted a couple of things that he's worried about, like money, um, that will, might prevent the program from being as successful and as sustainable as he'd like. So I've got a graph on the right side of the slide there. Uh, this is a paper that came out last year. It was about an innovation that was introduced into an American hospital, and the in innovation itself is, is not that important. But I think that you will be familiar with what it's showing. On the x-axis is, is effort, and uh, on the right axis is, is the time from implementation. And at the spike, um, let me see if I've got a pointer here. Yes. Um, so at, at the spike here, when you first start your, your intervention, whatever it is, if it's a sample transportation system or a uh, you're introducing a new drug or whatever it is, it takes a lot of effort. And then if it is going to be successfully integrated into the system, you know, that amount of effort is going to go down. And eventually it's going to be some bumps, but it's going to be pretty integrated. So 
The key issue here is scaling up innovations to be routine nationally, it turns out it's not simple to getting it to this, this sort of bumpy line down here. You need to, first of all, adopt this innovation to the local context, the situation in Uganda, the resources they have there, the types of roads they have, the type of requirements for motorcycles to carry, transport, to carry blood samples might be different in one country to another, and a million other things. So you've got to be willing to adopt what they have to a local context. Second, you really need to think about who your stakeholders are. And stakeholders include patients, because they are certainly invested in their own health, the healthcare workers, the laboratory professionals, the couriers they're taking us around. And you shouldn't forget about that central ministry of health, the ministry of finance, the donors. All of these parties want different things. And that's why the support to cross-cutting systems is particularly important. And uh, this includes monitoring evaluation, first of all. All of those parties want different things. And we, if we put too much monitoring and evaluation on it, however, the nurses and the couriers and the laboratory people who are responsible for actually doing this program are going to start to see the program as a burden. And therefore, you need to think very carefully about how you can intrinsically, what, what is the intrinsic motivation that they might have and the extrinsic motivation that they might have to participate in this project. So intrinsic motivation, hey, they know that the system is working better, the turnaround time is faster, the quality of the samples is, is, is more efficient. They might get their own self-satisfaction out of that, and it might be enough to drive them forward. That's a little bit of, of the carrot approach. But the stick is they also need some sort of performance manager telling them that this is important, you have to do this. And if it's too hard, if it's too cumbersome, then you also need to, need to find other incentives for them to do it. So you need that intrinsic motivation, that en extrinsic motivation, and, and uh, uh, basically that carrot and the stick. But what do the donors want? What is the government of Uganda, and particularly that Minister of Finance, that might one day be on the hook for this? They want to know that it's working. So you've got to balance this requirements for the m and &E and balance what the patients need with what these other ministries and, and parties might want. The other points I'm not going to go into, but there, those are obviously uh, the issues that are essential, HR, supervision, maintenance of these machines. He mentioned there's only one motorcycle per district. I can guarantee you that there was a, I don't know this for a fact, but I can guarantee you that there was a few times during this year when a motorcycle was out and the samples didn't get delivered. Um, a second motorcycle, a uh, 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 rainy day fund to patch that flat tire. You know, we talk about drones sometimes, the drone paper is excited, but if we can't consistently patch the flat tires in our motorcycles, how are we gonna keep those drones in the air? So this is my way of, of saying how we can uh, appropriately promote sharing and adaptation of these best practices, and I gave a, a version of this slide the other day, but I wanna introduce you perhaps or, or, or reinforce what you already may know about this sort of jargony word community or words, community of practice. So what's a community of practice? It's just a, a learning network of like-minded professionals. It would have a core group of people, probably with a coordinator. It would bring experts to the table who are leaders and actively engaged in using or implementing or curious about implementing sample transportation or other aspects of a laboratory system. It would add, bring the beginners in so that they can learn from the experts. That's how we all learn best from our peers. And then it would give opportunity for people who are sort of on the periphery, alumni or, or you know, lurkers is a word out there, um, who, who are outsiders or sponsors to make advantage of the knowledge that's at the center of this periphery that's being created by the interaction between the peers, by the lessons that are being shared in this interaction, excuse me, in between the experts and the beginners. That's a community of practice. So Gates Foundation right now is, is working on a grant uh, with, the, with ASLM. Some of you might have been in the session where we discussed this on Sunday morning. This is our, our proposed theory of action and in our question and answer session, I very much welcome feedback on it. We think ASLM in the dotted line, because we don't really know exactly what they're gonna do, should variously support some of these activities. We think that they need to define all of the work with countries and stakeholders and, and partners and everybody to define the key decisions in this viral load cascade with the spirit of thinking about what are those building blocks. The, the, in that first diagram I showed, what are the pieces of a laboratory system? You, the supply chain, the information systems, all those things. Each of those is a key decision in the viral load cascade, but also the policies and the governance. What do you, how are you incentivize the demand creation among the patients, incentivize demand creation among the providers? So define those key decisions.
make those sort of a assessment based on those key decisions. Go to a few countries and do assessments of their national laboratory systems. And then while you're there, prioritize what challenges you might find and identify best practices. So if this were to happen in Uganda, I think we very rightly would see a best practice coming out of that is sample transportation. But there might be four, five, six, seven more best practices that come out of Uganda, but there could be three or four things that they find really challenging that they could learn from other countries. So that's where we get this community of practice of national programs idea there. Creating a forum, virtual, maybe occasionally in person, to share these best practices probably, uh, it was, hopefully will take place in the next year or so, but including site visits from country to country and a general, um, a little bit of peer pressure, a little bit of competition. Hey, I got my thing working. Did you get your thing working? Key thing on Charles's point about money is if Charles has written up all this documentation and actually Pangea has helped do that documentation that shows how well the sample, sample transportation network is working, that can be translated into a country's national operational plan. And then when it's time for that global fund application or that PEPFAR country operational plan, and sometimes laboratory folks are a little bit later to that table than others, they can come, I've got a priority, here's my plan, here's all the data, how it's gonna help you, make sure you fund this going forward. And that's how you get into that implementation and ongoing QI. This is my last slide. It's pretty important that we also figure out how to measure success if we're gonna do this. And just some ideas for sample transportation and then for laboratory systems altogether. Uh, so we're moving forward, we're thinking about this. I welcome your comments.